Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us now then, lots to get through. Very happy to say we are joined by Fiona Hayes and Gordon Darcy, both Grand Slam winners. In fact, from now on, I will only talk to Grand Slam winners in this slot. I've just decided. Uh, you're both very welcome. You're there, Fiona. How are you, Joe? How are you getting on? Great. Gordon, hello. Yeah, how are you getting on, Joe? Hi, Fiona. Good evening to everybody. You were at the Leinster reunion, I presume. Did you make it over the weekend? The 2011-2012 teams, was it? Yeah, I got the tail end of it. I had to uh, get a little human christened, um, so that took priority. So uh, oh. we had a uh, we had our little daughter's christening uh, on uh, on Saturday. So I got in for the end of it. Good. And um, yeah, it was as wild as you could imagine. <laughs> I presume all the cliches apply. You all pick up right where you left yes. off. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Grown men descending into. <laughs> um, well, can only <laughs> yeah, better left unsaid. Fair Just that'll paint that'll paint as a vivid a picture a picture as anything else. No, I can imagine. I can imagine. And have you maintained uh, out of interest because it seems to be the case with most sports people? Have you uh, maintained a friendship with any number of those teammates that you would would have been so close to a, a decade ago? Generally, uh, not many friendships tend to endure. Yeah, like, I suppose, like, I played across three different decades. So, like, when I came into rugby at 18, all my friends went into academies and under 21s at that time and under 19s. I went straight in and started playing with guys who were, you know, coming to the end of their careers. Like, as you said, well, they weren't at the end of the careers at that time, but like, they were grown men like Victor Costello, um, Reggie Cargan, Mal O'Kelly. So, there's, a, there's kind of three different generations of, people I'm, I'm kind of uh, kind of friendly with but you can't be friends with everybody you've played for nearly 20 years you can be friends with a lot of people but there are yeah there are some guys in that group that I would still be very close with okay who would they be as a matter of interest um geez well it's one of these things you, you hope you hope it's re- reciprocal <laughs> um, <laughs> there's going to be news to several people listening <laughs> yeah yes yeah, very very strong news to a few of them but like catching up with yeah, Shane Horgan spent a lot of time with him obviously Brian is there um, catching up with him this guy like Owen Redden Fergus McFadden there's an awful lot of guys I've seen um, a lot of recently and then there's guys you actually spent an awful lot of time with and when you see them it's quite emotional and you kind of like it's so good to see them but you don't necessarily you wouldn't pick up the phone and have uh, ring them for a cup of coffee guys like Trevor Hogan Stephen Kyo, um that were you know real real guy, characters within the within the squad and then there's the guys that you know played um, were younger and were kind of filling in as you were kind of exiting towards the, the door that you, you cross over thing. And it's just lovely to catch up with them. Yeah. yeah, it's one of the great things, I suppose, to be in contact with so many different people uh, through your work. What about you, Fiona? Uh, yeah, I try and keep in contact with a, a good few of them. Um, we actually had, um, we used to call ourselves Fromance. It was a, a front row club. Um, <laughs> and uh, we still have a WhatsApp that uh, goes strong when we're looking at scrums and giving out about people as well. And uh, it was actually Fiona Coughlin was inducted into the Rugby Players Ireland Hall of Fame there. And um, there was a lot of people I hadn't seen in ages. So we were able to to get up and get into that. And obviously they love winding me up. So I went to the bathroom and the big picture was taken when I was gone out of the, <laughs> the room. So they've um, put a picture of me in it with uh, all my bows gear just to show I was actually there. But you do, you keep in contact. And as as Gordon said, when you meet some people you haven't seen in ages, it's just like back to normal. But you do end up talking rugby by the end of the night, I will say that. I would think the Fromance crew are quiet retiring types. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'll say no more. <laughs> I have loads to get through here. So... Uh, piece of news number one, it would seem according to Midi Olympique that Ron Nogara is extending his stay at La Rochelle to 2027. His current deal runs out 2024. Now, I don't know if there are release clauses or not. He was certainly on the three-man shortlist with Steve Borthwick and Scott Robertson. But it does seem, Fiona, as if we're not going to have to look at Raj in a white track suit banging <laughs> his desk as England beat Ireland. So uh, relief for everyone, I think. Yeah, relief. Look, for him personally, I'm sure it would have been a a great career move because obviously uh, we have to look at the World Cup, but England, I suppose, aren't playing the most exciting rugby at the minute. Um, uh, And it would be great for someone, whoever goes in there next, I'm sure they will have a a big influence on that squad, um, be it after the World Cup, I would imagine. So it would have been great for him personally. But um, I don't think for any Irish sporter looking at uh, Ronan O'Gara in a a white tracksuit up in that uh, coaching box, it would have been, uh, it would have had smiles on the face and especially 
especially not down in Munster. I can tell you that. I've heard uh, I've gotten a few texts asking people, am I in the know? Is he going to be doing it? I said, I, I know absolutely nothing, but we'll see in the future what will happen. Yeah, I would think, Gordon, so it, let's uh, take the reports, and they are just reports in France at the moment at face value from Midi Olympique. Say extends to 2027. Your sense of his trajectory, I, like I, I could understand that a real temptation to get in and involved a test level ASAP, he seems to be showing a degree of patience here. Yeah, well, like his every like he's a very calculated person. So uh, all of his moves have been quite strategic and moving along. And I suppose you don't necessarily want to rush away from a good thing. Um, very well supported by the club, um, and they have a big budget as well. So you know the being able to coach that quality of players you don't necessarily walk away from it it's very hard to walk away from that where you know you have that quality of players at your at your disposal um and you really i suppose the international stage can be a graveyard for new coaches yeah so you know if you do well it can you know copper fasten your credentials as a I take an emotion completely out of this and say, forget about if he's playing, you know, has played for Munster and, and has ambitions to coach Ireland, is Irish and all that kind of sentiment around it. Um, if you don't do well in your first international coaching job, it can be very hard to pick up um, the pieces. And even coaches that do well internationally, if they have a bad end to their career, find it hard to get um, to get new jobs. I'd say Stuart Lancaster and that English coaching ticket are the exception rather than, rather than the norm. Yeah, it's true. Uh, John Cooney has been talking to the Ulster Rugby Show. So John Cooney is certainly not ruling out a switch to Scotland next year. These are the new World Rugby eligibility rules. So if you have not played international rugby for three years and if you have a strong link to the country you're looking to switch to, be that having been born in that country or have a parent or grandparent from that country, then you can switch. And this was... Uh, certainly talked about as being very beneficial for the Pacific nations, lots of former All Blacks having roots in Fiji and Samoa and Tongva. But John Cooney, this, I mean, absolutely the Scottish link would apply. So what he has said to the Ulster Rugby Show is, I'll make the decision on my own terms and whatever I feel is right for me. Half of my family live in Scotland. My dad's a proud Scotsman. I can see other people's perception of it as in the, the controversy or the, the, you know, the sense that, well, you have 11 caps for Ireland, should you be really moving to Scotland? I can see other people's perception of it, but they're generally people who have uh, no connection or affiliation to another country. And he obviously does. I can see both sides of the conversation. I won't be listening to the outside noise. Either way, I know my dad would be immensely proud if I did play for Scotland. So Cooney won the last of his 11 international caps against England in the Six Nations. Doesn't seem to be part of the plans. As of uh, Six Nations next year, he can switch. And if he did and it goes well, we'll be facing him at a World Cup. I mean, it's, it's, it's um, unusual. It'll be a first, certainly in this part of the world, with, with this new eligibility um, rule. Fiona, why didn't Cooney's face fit? Because I'm, I'm, I think lots of us were missing something. Every time we watched him, all action for Ulster, scoring tries, box kicking, leader it seemed like his services would be required in an Irish jersey, but it just has not been the case to the extent that he's now been stood down for three years. Yeah, it's a funny one. I think it's a lot to do with how people train and, and what's going on up in camp. We're not involved in that. There's, I'm not saying that he's a, in any way, shape or form got a bad personality, but that comes into the mix as well when you're trying to gel teams together, trying to get um, leaders on board. And I think he kind of fell into that category as well where he's not too old, but we had uh, probably a couple of scrum halves that were ahead of him and then Gibson Park came in as well. And when you're looking at the next generation um, you just, Joe, I think you want to breed a younger type of scrum half and maybe try and get them into the mix. Cooney was playing the best rugby of his life at times and you could see, you know, Ulster fans were, were crying out for him to be given a shot. And he went up to a couple of camps, but he just didn't seem to catch the eye of Andy Farrell and he never seemed to, to kick on from there. As I said, I think it's all, you know, got to do with who's coming through, what you're viewing, um, the future being like. And with nine and 10, um, we've seen it with 10, I think you've got to you've got to find these kind of guys early and stick with them through games and it seems Andy Farrell just didn't back him and and went to look at the young ones then next coming through yeah I take the age point absolutely but then I also think well Gibson Park is 30 not exactly a man for the future it's it's interesting Gordon that Fiona 
half skirted around that sense that Cooney's face doesn't fit in some way and none of us know what's going on behind the scenes but he, he has played that well that one of the few reasons that makes sense is that his face doesn't fit somehow and again it's hard for us to know but it's it's a, it's yeah. a very striking situation yeah it's a funny one because for me he is the like he's in the two best scrum halves in Ireland yeah um, on a purely rugby base we just judge him on what he does within the white lines in 80 minutes he to me suits exactly the way Ireland have the play um, and, and in some ways I think you know if you look at say New Zealand who you know are, are the standard bearers maybe not at the moment but they play two very similar scrum halves in Aaron Smith and uh, TJ Perinara um, they don't have that contrasting type of uh, approach that they, they double down on the way they want to play yeah um, so I was always kind of, you know, like there's something something doesn't add up in here because if you're anyone with two eyes who's watching him perform goes, he should be in the top two or three uh, scrum halves in Ireland, um, un- unquestionably. So something doesn't fit. Mm. And I think one of the things is you, you can you can have that and you can talk about it and that that's fine. We don't make these coaching decisions and the coaching group have made a decision on him. And to be fair, they haven't really got many things wrong. So for whatever reason, we're not privy to it. It's not coming out. We'll never get the actual, um, we'll never get a definitive answer to it. Um, There's lots of other, there's lots of, I suppose, subtle criteria that, you know, influence coaches. Um, But if it was on purely performance, I would say he has a very, very strong case to feel aggrieved and clearly does feel aggrieved. Mm. Um, But there's obviously more to it. We don't really know what the criteria is from it. Um, But this coaching ticket has massively earned the right to make big decisions like this. That's precisely right, I think. This would be a much more contentious point if the coaching ticket didn't have so much credit in the bank. Questions would be asked at every press conference, explain the Cooney situation. But as you said credit in the bank I mean I hope he doesn't have a vengeful streak because he'll have a point to prove I know in a World Cup pool game uh, which again would just be um, be amazing Fiona if that came to fruition I suspect he's good enough to get in that Scottish first 15 Look, I I definitely think he is. And, you know, I'd have no issues with that. Everyone wants to play international rugby, um, especially professions that are in rugby absorbed in it week in, week out. You're looking at guys going to a World Cup and imagine probably knowing three years away from a World Cup that that you're you're not going to be going just because of whatever is going on inside or outside of camp. As I said, I'm not sure. So I think fair play to him if 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 the if the rule is there and he's able to avail of it and and get on that Scottish squad. And and to be fair, at nine there ha- Scott, the Scottish nines there hasn't been anyone that has been strikingly immense and amazing playing the last couple of Six Nations. So he's in with a shot and he definitely is very capable of controlling a game. And to think of him coming up against an Irish team and knowing the ins and outs of everyone on that team it actually would be kind of a scary prospect Oh, I can see him now doing a celebration in front of Andy <laughs> Farrell in the coaching box no, it's, a, you know? it's a bigger it's a bigger question for him though it's not that, it's not a binary oh I just go there and stay with Ulster as soon as he if he accepts that he becomes a non-qualified and then we'll have to decide Ulster would Ulster would have to decide is he one of their non-qualified mm. uh, overseas players he did reference um, in the in the wider comments having to sit down with Ulster and have discussions so you're dead right to highlight that yeah, and I think like I think it depends on how happy he is there. You talk about the age profile, how much is he enjoying his rugby there? Maybe he's wondering, you know, uh, with Doak breeding him behind, maybe it's time for a change of scene. You never like you, you never know. It's mm. it's it's a, it, it is really it is really a funny one, and uh, yeah, it, it will be interesting to see what decision he makes. Yeah, well, that'll be in the new year, so plenty for him to ponder over Christmas. And Fiona, briefly, would you agree with Gordon's assessment that just based on what we're seeing on the pitch, what we see publicly, he really is in the top one, two? of the scrum halves in the country? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you look at form and how people have been playing, he's probably uh, pipped Murray at times. I know um, Gibson Park has really, really performed for him for him for Ireland when he's been on the pitch he's had a couple of injuries with Leinster but he's anytime he's been on there he, he's just and the same with Leinster he's given it 100% the only thing I, I, I might say as well is you have the likes of Doak and Casey they're a different type of nine they come on and they really speed that game up and they try to get things moving so maybe they've kind of looked at it at moving to the younger generation about getting that nine in that's probably a bit more bite in them Cooney is excellent kicking game and everything controls everything really really well but might not have the same zip as the two young guys come at so maybe they're just looking at that for the future. Uh, World Rugby had a meeting last week 
and Bill Bowman, the head of World Rugby, he described the conference as, quote, the first step towards a reimagination of our sport. So it seems what happened at this conference, various stakeholders put forward various ideas to improve the flow of rugby, to speed up the game. So some of the ideas include a shot clock timer on scrums and reset scrums. So there'll be a shot clock. You have to be ready to go. Uh, same for line outs, same for kicks at goal, a shot clock. Top 14 does have a clock for kicks at goal. And there is supposed to be a 60 seconds per penalty and 90 seconds per conversion rule, but it's never really enforced. So uh, I don't know, Fiona, if you have any uh, genius ideas that you want to introduce to make rugby um, a better watch. But certainly it's, it's, um, it's very notable that even World Rugby acknowledges there is a problem with ball and play time and just the general flow of a game. Yeah, I think so, and uh, I might be, uh, I might get in trouble for saying this, but I also think that you know you're trying to make the game safer. I completely understand that, and they're zoning in and you know late hits, dangerous tackles, and all that. But I think there needs to be a very a much quicker process with that. That when it's spotted, maybe it's someone off, like they almost do in rugby league, where you're off and you're or you're on report, and they'll have a look at that. Maybe after the game, you go off for those few minutes. But um, it seems like the game is really, really slowed down, and I know when I went over to New Zealand um, a friend of mine is working with the Highlanders but he's more the commercial side of it and he spoke how rugby in New Zealand that a lot of people are switching to watch rugby league just because rugby league work and do everything in their favour to try and speed up that game and get it going and the more you kind of watch rugby union it's getting slower if you time the games it could be going on for two hours almost yeah. like American football so they've definitely got to look at that area and I think they they kind of you know really pressing that uh, kicking clock and scrum clock 100% behind that but I think they need to look at maybe really hurrying up when when that TMO comes in making a decision and not looking at 45 times while we're all waiting around the TV Yeah they, they touched on that there was talk of trying to make the TMO referee conversation more binary as in just give me the answer let's not mm. have a symposium here the two of us yapping on for five minutes so that's definitely one of the suggestions and uh, I mean the Lions Tour of 2021. My strongest memory of that, Gordon, is just watching South Africans walk as slowly as possible to the next line out. Yeah, well, like that was that, that that South Africa. I don't think that was particular. That was especially around that uh, that game. They walked pretty slowly to every line out because they know they're going to win it and uh, mauls the life out of you. Um, I think the the game's at a, it's, it's at an inflection point. Unfortunately, we are at this point where um, there's so many head collisions and things like that because ta players are not adjusting their their tackle entry. So it feels like we're at this pain point that we actually have to go through. But like we're still, we still have this legacy rugby league upright tackle technique that is so prevalent in, 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 in the game. And like until that changes, until we genuinely start going tackle height, where these collisions start becoming the, um, aren't the norm in, like in, in the passage of play, you, then you can start bringing in the third match official and kind of going, okay, head collision, they're working through all the yoke talking it into the referee and saying here's your decision do you agree with it yes or no and he's like cool you know and, he, and he's reviewing it then in like 30 seconds or whatever but until like because you know there's so many of them happening like what was the last day against australia it was just constant stops breaks and play um because when the ball is actually moving we have passage of play the game actually rewards um and this is the kind of contradiction in it the actual when the ball is in play mm it's actually enjoyable to watch because it's rewarding attacking rugby yeah. um, and teams that are on the front foot are finding it easier to maintain um, uh, front football. So teams that play the way to lose, teams that play the way Leinster play um, are rewarded by playing positive rugby. But it's just trying to keep that up in, up, uh, keeping that pace in the game. It's a challenge. And do teams, Gordon, set out to akin to South Africa because I always pick in South Africa which is maybe a touch unfair that line series was just a real nadir uh, to what extent do you see teams going out to make games as slow and as stop start as possible uh, yeah I think, the, but I think there's, a, there's a coaching element to this as well how they're being set up like the game you know um, teams that are like box kicking the way the way the game has evolved the way teams kick to regather now has changed out of sight so when you see teams doing that big long worm and putting five bodies into that breakdown. Yeah. The opposition are now going, well, we don't have to put anybody in that. So we'll put 15 and we'll defend that and we'll take the ball back. Like it, it makes no sense. So the, the, I think there are some teams who are innovating in this uh, new style of rugby. 
Um, and there are people who are still the laggards. And unfortunately, the majority of them may be laggards that are still trying to trying to catch up and have to embrace because we've moved from this whole overly structured phase play. And now we're talking about this broken field, uh, open rugby. But we're asking players to think again. And some teams are some teams of players are adapting to that quicker and other teams are still desperate for that structure. So you're kind of in this transition piece. And I would say over the next 10 months, we will see a, a, another evolution in that ahead of the World Cup. Okay, interesting. We'll watch this space. Uh, Champions Cup launch was on all week. It was in London today. I'm curious for your general take on the health of the competition. Now, at a glance, by the way, the opening round of fixtures, Racing hosting Leinster and then Munster to lose on the Sunday and Ulster are away to sail in round one, but round two, they bring Ron O'Gara's La Rochelle to Belfast. There's actually kind of, from an Irish point of view, there's some really uh, intriguing fixtures to get excited by. And you have the South African element as well. Stormers away to Claremont has a real novelty value uh, as well. So there's still lots of good things about this tournament and yet Fiona, just talking to uh, the average rugby fan, it seems from the heyday of when Gordon was playing in in it in particular, be it the TV schedule or the new pool stage, the new format, it feels like it's in decline. I was about to say rapid decline, that's a little bit too extreme perhaps, but it doesn't feel like it's it's blossoming or it's where it was 10 years ago, that's for sure. Where are you on this tournament? Look, I love it. I I was grow, I grew up next to Toman Park, as a lot of people know. I, I absolutely, I've seen the big games, 2006 sale. You know, I think people play their best rugby um, in these games. They're immense. They're immensely physical. It gets... Um, it gets the provinces a chance to go up against the French, the English, before we head into the Six Nations. I suppose it's up to the organisers, I think, Joe. I mean, we, we've gone through a huge... People, you know, have probably gone through the the, the November internationals are really after taking off and there's a lot of rugby being played. We saw Australia came, come over and play a lot of games. So it's kind of condensed into, into that. You're just finished that and now you're going into, to, I suppose, Heineken Cup weekend. Or, and it's it's it needs to be advertised a little bit more, I think. I think it's there I think the people know the difference they love those games mm. but I, I find even going to Toman Park I'll be going to the Toulouse game I can't wait but it's it's not the same buzz around the place and, and I don't know exactly how they're going to do that but they need to try and get a little bit of spark into life into these games as well Yeah Gordon not the same buzz it's funny, right? Because you go back to when this was the Heineken. It was the European. It was the whatever the Heineken European Cup. I remember they just they took the European piece out of it and became the Champions Cup. And I always felt they go, why? Like it just feels very, very odd they've done that. Um, and like when you look, when you when you when you, when you join all the uh, pieces of paper together, you go like they really were paving the way for this European uh, Cup to be expanded to the South African franchises long time before they ever joined the URC. Um, so this has been this has been in the making for a long time. And the way they changed the sponsorship and they tried to adopt that European football model, it just never really materialized. Um, and the group format has, I think it, it fit a purpose during COVID um, because everybody had to be agile. They had to respond to what the, uh, the pulls and the pushes were happening. Um, but I think it doesn't. I think it takes away from the uh, the overall uh, tournament. I think the group stages kind of is almost like a. It's a we have to get through this to get to the actual exciting games. Yeah. Um. But there's an awful lot more competition now, um, for eyes and for viewers, and this format doesn't feel like it's as captivating as some of the matches in the URC with what's on the line for them and what's happening in the Premiership in the top fourteen. Because it's funny, Fiona, you mentioned, was it the Miracle match, which is yeah. very much a group, a pool stage match, but like the, some of Munster's best moments are in those pool stage matches, the Northampton drop goal kick and all of these games. And there was a rhythm to the season. I also wonder, and this is pure speculation on my part, but it is quite interesting that uh, RTE have taken over from Virgin with the, the one free to air game across the weekend. And that deal seems to be an upgrading uh, to the extent that it will involve a province it looks like most weekends I think BT do an excellent job genuinely their coverage is top top some of the stuff they do in game where they have two and three people on the commentary and they analyse uh, pieces of play in real time is phenomenal but there is a reality that most people in this country certainly don't have BT and I just wonder if if the tournament organisers in, in giving at least a, a province a free to air game with RTE now, I think it is a recognition that actually this has just maybe Fiona fallen a touch off uh, the, the the screens of people 
up and down the country. Yeah, that's it. I mean, especially nowadays, you know, a lot of people don't don't pay money to, to be getting Sky Sports or the BT packages and they're used to watching their games and they'll watch something else or watch the highlights later on in the evening. But I think it's it is definitely that they're trying to give it back to the to I suppose the country who are going to screen these games and it's it's getting the fans on board. I but you know, like I remember even you're talking about that 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 drop goal in twenty eleven against Northampton. I remember like the forty one phases before that and just and just being in Toman Park and soaking up those that atmosphere, um, there's just been some massive moments, and I'm sure Gordon played in the you know huge games for Leinster as well. And it's it's a different it's a different type of cup. And you know going forward, I know the South African teams are in it. Maybe I think they could also take a look at kind of so the games are better in the pool stages. Maybe eight English teams, maybe eight French teams. You have a couple here that probably will make the top eight that won't be as interested as maybe if you had URC see there's there's a higher competition there so even looking at changing that around a small bit might kind of add to the tournament as well but the best games some of the best games of rugby I've ever witnessed and especially ever drank at up in Tolman Park are, are definitely Heineken Cup games and you know it's it's just a great the lads you know you, you see lads that are out injured and they're really trying hard to, to get back for these games they know there's an extra push as well that might get them into a camp for the six nations that will be coming up after Christmas so there is a lot of stake and I think it just needs to kind of get its buzz back, be yeah. it bringing it on telly, you know, um, to the local channels. That might add a little bit of zip to it as well. Uh, URC before then. So at the weekend, Edinburgh Munsters on Friday, Connacht have Bennett on in Galway on Saturday and then Leinster, Ulster certainly catches the eye. Saturday, 7.35. At the weekend, we touched on it on Monday, but uh, Munster winners against Connacht, 24-17. Leinster beat Glasgow, 40 points to five and Ulster were 36-15 winners against Sebre. So Gordon, I, I don't know, did you catch Leinster-Glasgow or were you really at the afters of this reunion? <laughs> Um, no, I, I was uh, what you call it. I was in the afters of my christening uh, while the match was going. Sorry, after the uh, christening, so, yes, yeah. yeah, no, I, I caught I caught bits and bits and bobs of it. Um, so like Leinster full value for the win as they as they always are, and just have like Leo hits the nail on the head every time. They were they were patchy at, at pieces, but you know how much how many of that team will feature this week? Mm. Probably not a huge amount. Yeah. Um. So you would expect. Um. This is one of the matches that like the reality is Leinster don't need to win this game but they will want to. Mm. Um, so you would expect a fairly um, a fairly strong uh, line out from uh, from Leinster with a with a view to uh, pivoting into or kick kickstarting them into next week. It's uh, always difficult to judge. You know, uh, Rob Russell scores a hat trick, and all these players come on and seem to do well for Leinster, and they all look very good. Who's catching your eye, if anyone? And, and I, I sort of ask in the context of you were part of the quote unquote golden generation. And then it seemed there was another pretty golden generation straight after you. And now I think we're talking about like this conveyor belt and we're almost uh, comfortable in the assumption it is a conveyor belt. Is, is, is the talent coming through as good as ever? Who is catching your eye? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very hard question to answer yeah. because they're not playing against the opposition where they're being tested. Um, so you can say Rob Russell has, um, you know, scores a hat trick, and Harry Byrne comes on and plays forty minutes. And Ross plays it, plays it, plays plays the game. Um, it, it goes it goes well for them. But you know, really, they didn't really have to work for much in the in in the game. So it's very hard to give an accurate uh, um, assessment of that because these guys don't feature in the in the big games. You look at players like Jimmy O'Brien; he features in games because he's um, He's being very, very consistent. Um, so if you go, a lot of these players would have played in the first match Leinster played in Italy this year. Um, I was commentating that game and I was surprised by the lack of quality, uh, simple execution across the board by a lot of the a lot of the outside backs. And I think that conveyor belt might still be there in the in the pack. I think there's a questionable level of the of the very very high standards that we're looking at and that's important to caveat that yeah when you're talking about the Luke Fitzgeralds and the Rob Carneys and all of these guys that have just come through the Gary Ringrose that have come through academies are these guys at the same caliber of that they haven't forced their way into the match day 23s and very many uh, European matches so I think that jury is still out on that mm. at the moment yeah what's your sense Fiona 
Yeah, I think um, I think you're you're on the ball there. I think it, it's the big games. They haven't really had the chance to show it, um, you know. But I, I I do think it's good that they're some of these guys are back playing AIL as well at weekends, so they're getting that rugby time. And when they're called up, I thought Jamie Osborne is another guy that that catches the eye. Um, and obviously in the pack, I'm I'm a big fan of Max Stegan. It's just trying to get these those high level intense games to see that if needed when it comes to the big games that they'll be able to take that step up. The conveyor belt is always there. Thomas Clarkson is another prop I, who, who I love watching. I think he's good around the pitch. So they definitely have the talent, but it's it's about playing that high level and you can't really see much, I suppose, when you're looking at AIL. Obviously, they, they play exceptionally well and they stand out in their AIL games and when they come into these games, I mean, Glasgow Warriors, probably not the, the highest opposition, definitely not the most physical opposition, but they but they played well and I thought they eventually grew into the game and you see that it does take time for teams to settle if they haven't had much game time. Monster so so you say yeah. you mentioned uh, Jamie Osborne there because actually it's a good chance he may play this week and it'll be interesting to see where they play him and it'll be interesting to see how he goes because um, they could need him in the centre mm-hmm. um, in next week. Um, so between him and Gary Ringrow. So this, so as you know, as as, as I'm saying, oh, they're not forcing their way into the into the team. Sometimes you don't get the opportunity when you get to play. Yeah. So Jamie Osborne might come in at 13 or might come in at 12 or he may share the load with Gary Ringrose this week. That'll be really, really interesting to see how he goes because if uh, uh, Charlie Knight I picked up a, and that I picked up a shoulder injury, he's not available. This could be his opportunity to get a run of games. Um, and, you know, in the you know, in the in the story of the what ifs and he could end up, you know, being in Six Nations squad or going into a World Cup and this could be his moment to to to, to shine. So he is definitely a standout player if you're absolutely right. Okay. I know you have to go, um, Gordon Times tight. Munster beat Connacht at the weekend, a uh, line from your Irish Times piece. You said when Joey Carby or Jack Crowley glided through the Connacht defence or that offload from John Hodnett put Antoine Frisch away. Munster were unable to convert these positive attacking moments into direct scores. That must change. So they are having positive attacking moments, at least. Are we seeing improvement here from Munster on, on what we were saying a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, it's like I think so. Like they're they are and again, it's 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 an impossible situ- situation for them because they want to. They, you need to. I've talked about how the game rewards attacking rugby at the moment, so they have to learn how to attack and you know and again under Van Graan they didn't play an awful lot of attacking rugby um, like an awful lot of very phase orientated rugby whereas now they're asking them to you know to attack so they are creating these line breaks which is really really encouraging the next development has to be that when you get those line breaks that it's a terminal uh, line break as in they score a try they finish off that move and have the the vision and the ability to uh, to do because teams will always honeypot into the um, to the rook around the line break. They have to be able to manif- build that into a score because that's more devastating to a team um, psych- psychologically um, or you know mentally than giving up a penalty and then getting mauled over the line. Yeah, that full you know when you play against Toulouse and you play against these teams where they just blow you away and you're at a rook you look up they've scored you're like oh sugar but a walk back to the pitch it's mo- it's it's much more psychologically uh, demanding to be a- and and requires way more resilience to play in that whereas the stop start nature of it um they got the tries but I think that has to be the next growth for them where they can kill off teams with those when they get those line breaks when they get in behind you have to finish them off yeah. I, Fiona, the optimistic uh, viewpoint to, to pick up on Gordon's point would be Munster under Van Graan, not very practiced at making these line breaks. Having them, you know, and, and so the more they do it, the better they'll become at the next stage. Uh, I'm not sure what the negative uh, or less optimistic viewpoint would be, but certainly that'd be the optimistic one. Yeah, and look, I mean, they're trying offloads that they might have tried in the past. And, you know, these things you hope will eventually click together. And when these guys are running lines and when they're on the end of these, that it's it's working. And you can see it's happening, as Gordon said, in, in different bits and different parts of the field. But the best teams in the world finish off that and are absolutely lethal when they get inside the 22. For Munster, sometimes they revert back to that old style of rugby when they get maybe 10, 15 metres out. They have changed it up. I've seen a few different things. We've 
saw in Parky Cueve as well, you know, a couple of cross field kicks. So I think once their confidence starts to build up and up, these things will start clicking. And they definitely are trying to style rugby. I like that these young guys are getting an opportunity. I know there was a lot of talk about the scrum and Josh Witcherly, but he's a baller around the park. He can offer you that. So it's it's getting him that game time. And you can always work on the scrum and you can he can get into the gym now, you know, and, and, and start maybe bulking up a little bit in the next couple of years. But you have these guys with the potential of not just going out there holding scrums or whatever. These are absolutely football players and that's the way Munster need to go. They need to be getting everybody out there and getting people on the ball and and hopefully it'll all start to click because I do like this and Mike Prendergast definitely likes this attack in style rugby and we're seeing it in bits and bobs. Hopefully we'll see it in full force over the next few weeks, especially against Toulouse. Well, especially against Toulouse, yeah. Antoine Frisch seems to have uh, settled in very nicely as well. Uh, just a last one, Gordon and I will bow to your knowledge here. So you uh, grew up near Thomond Park and now you're de- down near uh, Porky Cueve. So there was much <laughs> talk after that game against South Africa that the Cork public had been feeling a touch ignored by Munster Inc. Is that a, a sentiment you tend to hear? Should we be seeing more games down in Cork? Are you trying to get me killed, Joe? <laughs> 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 the People's Republic of Cork. Um, look, uh, I, I've talked to people, a lot of people down here feel like, you know, they've lost touch a little bit with uh, Munster Rugby because it's all the big games are played in Thoman Park. So uh, I, I think why not delve out a few? Obviously, Musgrave Park wasn't big enough to hold the capacity, but we were down there, Joe. We saw the buzz, the atmosphere. If you can get a couple of, a couple of those games on during the, week, uh, during the year to get the Cork back on that Munster bandwagon, I think why not? And I'd be happy to to do that because I, I obviously own a house down here and I go up to my mother so either it'll be grand for me <laughs> yeah and then, but then I guess you'll have Limerick saying well we're paying our season tickets you're taking <laughs> yeah. to lose to Cork so it's tricky exactly uh, guys thank you so much Gordon appreciate it thanks Emil thanks very much thanks Joe thanks Fiona Fiona thank nice. you see ya nice one guys Talk rugby to you later. Bye-bye. on off the ball is thanks to Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us